I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over. And Jenny O'Dell, well, let's put it this way. I'm just one of Jenny O'Dell's many, many fans. If you have read How to Do Nothing, and there were a lot of us that did, and a lot of us who took a lot of what she said to heart, although some people were looking for prescriptive outlines, and we are going to cover a little bit of that because that's not what this book is. Saving Time is the new book. And Jenny's asking us to reimagine how we look at time, reinvent how we look at time. You might even be asking us to rethink time altogether. And it's really great to see you. And I cannot wait for this conversation. (laughs) So can I ask you, um, I'm going to steal something from chapter three. Actually, I'm going to steal the title of the third chapter of Saving Time. Can there be leisure? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that is. It's funny that you should mention that it's the title because I changed the title. Oh, wow. Partways through okay. writing it. I think it was okay. something else. And then as I was researching it, I kind of just like ran into this conceptual like quandary and I'm like, can there be leisure? And so that's why the title is <laughs> Can There Be Leisure? I think like I, I had to go through several versions of no to get yeah. to like a provisional yes. So one way that it there can't be leisure is that um, everything that sort of looks like leisure or feels like leisure um, is so easily packaged and sold to us. And that's like not a coincidence. Like as I was looking into the history of how like American leisure in particular has been conceived of, it's always had a relationship to consumerism. Mm -hmm. Sort of like you work at your job for a wage and you pay your wage for the experience of leisure. And that kind of like keeps the wheels turning. Now I think you can see like a really maybe like elaborated version of that um, Mm -hmm. on things like Instagram where like, the image of something or the idea of something can so quickly be turned into something that can be sold. I mean, it's like Mm -hmm. someone had an idea one day, like a meaningful, you know, authentic idea of a human connection and the next day it's for sale, you know? So it's like, that's definitely happening. And I, and I talk in that part of the book about working at great America, Paramount's great America, which is a theme park. uh, When I was 18, 18 and 19 doing caricatures that and growing up in a sort of, pretty soulless suburb really kind of oriented me against this idea of like commodified leisure, like almost like Daria-esque um, like <laughs> attitude towards like, that's so fake, you know, like I, I grew up, oh, yeah. you know, so I'm, I'm still, and I'm still like that. So that's one, one trap you can fall into. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other, it's not so much a trap, but it's just a, like a complication is that even non-commercial leisure, which I really, you know, in How to Do Nothing, like I talk about the Rose Garden, I was really kind of pointing to those kinds of leisure spaces as being sort of utopian, like it's a place where you can go to be not a customer and not a worker, you can just exist. Um, And I think I still find that ideal very beautiful, but in the history, again, in the US, like of these kinds of spaces, the Rose Garden, for example, was in an area that would have been like de facto white because of redlining. There are a lot of things happening in society that were just also in, in leisure, right. Or they were like reproduced inside leisure, like forms of social hierarchy and exclusion were also happening in those spaces. And then there was this like other sort of idea, especially I think in the maybe uh, early 20th century that like leisure would make a more productive citizen or like, you know, prepare men for the army. Like recreation was like this kind of thing that was like a value add (laughs) to people, (laughs) to the citizenry. I think that's the point at which I was like, can there be leisure, right? Like, you know, even now it's like trying to, you know, go on vacation or or just like have a leisurely moment and at a time when you're so aware of what's happening around mm-hmm. that space and in that space. Birding, for example, it's impossible to go birding without thinking about climate change. You just, yep. you just can't. And so I think what I ended up with at the end of that like exploration was maybe leisure isn't this like static category, but rather a little interruption in the kind of like work and refreshment for work like an interruption in that, that allows you to kind of like see outside of that plane of existence. And maybe it's still refreshing, but I think of it as almost more like spiritually refreshing than like being able to go to work energetically on Monday, kind of refreshing, which I think, you know, we also need that. But I think that's a different thing. Um, Yeah, I'm going to grab a piece of language that you use later in the book where you're talking about systems of time. And I'm jumping around a little bit because you have me thinking in so many different directions now because of this book, which I love. But the idea of leisure as a system of time, right? Like not everyone has access necessarily to 
you know, certain kinds of leisure and that we really do need to de- redefine and change how we think about what leisure can look like, but also how we access it. And you talk about this one book and you've read so much and put so much research into this book, but yet it flies. It's from like 1925 and it sounds very self-helping. And <laughs> dude is just like, don't look out the window. <laughs> don't read on cars or buses or trains. And don't yeah. look out the window and just stare at other people and relax. <laughs> and then you can subtract those minutes you spent relaxing from, sleep. from sleep. And I was just like, dude, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing book, this all wrong. <laughs> that book is incredible. I And I have to give a shout out to mm-hmm. um, the Perlinger Library, which okay. is a small but very powerful community library mm-hmm. in San Francisco with amazing volunteer librarians. And one of them knew that I was working on this project and he okay. pulled that book out for me. Um, and I was just going through it, like with just utter like disgust and delight um, because it's like someone who really admires Taylorism as many yep. people did at the time. Yep. And is like, what if you apply this to your entire life? And actually, no, why haven't you applied this to your entire life? Like he has a speed reading section like an actual section where he like, it's like one page is like letters and then the next one is words. And, you know, and he's like, okay, time yourself. Yeah. Um, and like, are you, are you thinking efficiently? Like, he's like, like not, not talking about factories anymore. Like you're talking about your thoughts. That's obviously a very specific way of thinking about time. Um, and it's seductive because I think like, that was what was seductive about Taylorism and the idea of applying it elsewhere. It was like, you could have total control over something and you could make it run faster and better and more efficiently. And I think, yeah, when I'm talking about these interruptions, it's like interrupting that entire way of thinking about time. It's not like having a little break. It's like a big, like, even if it's brief, it feels Mm -hmm. like a genuine interruption where like time, time feels different. You feel different. You're kind of like that speck in the universe or something, you know? And then it's like, it always collapses back in after that. This show is going to um, air really close to your pub date. So would you take a second and explain what Taylorism is for folks who may not have read the book by the time we we air the show? Yeah. So Taylorism, um, it's like a system of organizing work that uh, was originated uh, by Frederick. Is it Frederick Taylor? I think so. Am I getting that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so that was a very early 20th century innovation. Um, And so if anyone knows, you know, the image of Charlie Chaplin on the assembly line. Like that's kind of like classic Taylorism in my mind, where you have tasks that are broken up into kind of the smallest bits that Mm -hmm. they can, or the simplest bits they can be broken up into assigned to different workers. You know, they'll literally be something that looks like a spreadsheet that shows how much time each little motion should take um, as you're like assembling some say machinery. And that was a very expressly done in order to make it go faster. It's to make it go more efficiently and faster, like not having people do sort of um, unnecessary motions that would take longer. Aristotle, you say, also used work and the concept of work to, like leisure doesn't exist for Aristotle outside of this framework of work. And to think that we go all the way back to sort of classical Greece and we've just kept these patterns going. (laughs) For a really long time. And at one point in the book, you're just like, well, I found leisure while I was cooking. I found leisure not just in, you know, bird watching and other things, but like I can be folding socks and I found leisure. And I've had similar moments. I mean, mostly just staring out windows. I, I love staring out of windows in the car or on a train and not doing anything. And I mean, it's also time to read, but at the same time, like sometimes I just want to stare out a window. Yeah. It's so excellent. Yeah. Yeah. But where else have you found leisure? I mean, you have really connected with the outdoors in a lot of different ways. You're also a visual artist as well as a writer. So what, how do you define leisure for you? I mean, I think I've really adopted the kind of the idea from that book that I cite, um, mm-hmm. Leisure the Basis of Culture, where it's yeah. really more a state of mind than, as I was saying, like a category of time. Or like you could say it's like an attitude towards the world. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's been sort of helpful for me in thinking about it is like almost as a posture, right? It's like there's a posture that it's a real one, I know, because I have back problems. Like, you know, like where you're like you're so focused on this thing that you need to finish or um you want to do faster or 
you're just your your world is kind of small and it's focused around this thing and anything else that happens around that is either gonna help you do that thing or it's an interruption and it's like a nuisance and like I find that in that stance like other people feel very far away like they just kind of everything feels very like instrumental and, and far away and that's kind of like leaning forward and then there's like I think of like leaning back like sitting back in the chair mm-hmm. you know I describe you know much later in the book this idea of tiredness mm-hmm. um like a tired the uh, Peter Hanke the the poet right. like right. you know tiredness that trusts in the world where you kind of let go of that thing that you were Mm -hmm. grasping onto so hard and as a result of letting go everything else floods back in Uh, like the rest of the world comes back into your your consciousness and I find that that's often like a very surprising um, surprising experience because it's it's you're letting in what is outside of what you were thinking about a moment before and so that to me is leisure now yeah, no, I totally get that. And also, a lack of letting go brings us to nostalgia, right? Like Nostalgia, in a lot of ways, can actually be not great, right? Like, it can be a bad, bad thing when you're nostalgic for stuff that either didn't exist or is somehow warped in its ideal or what have you. You talk about how nostalgia can be atemporal and, and you can lose all sense of time and, and life and everything else. And it's like that letting go, you need to find those spaces in order to be in the world. And I love that idea. That makes me so happy because it is, it's a very simple idea. And I think it has broken some people's brains (laughs) because it seems to me so many people have asked you like, how do I do this? Literally wanting a script, wanting bullet points, wanting like numbered outline. (laughs) Yeah. Right. And it's like, I don't know. There's no recipe for that. I think part of it though, is like, you know, to cut people some slack. Like I think there are like languages for the ways that we talk about things like time. Like in this mm-hmm. book, I, I'm relying on language a lot as a metaphor. We talk about clock time and we think in clock time because we have to live in clock time. With that comes all these ideas like time being standardized and interchangeable and kind of mm-hmm. empty. Like it gets filled with work mm-hmm. or it gets squeezed for value, what, what have you. And even though that's not like true or a psychological experience of time, like anyone knows that um, it's still the way that we think about time mm-hmm. a lot of the time. And so you get, you know, other ideas too, like that there's work time and leisure time mm-hmm. and that those are ca- like quantifiable categories. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's harder to think about, but also I think more accurate to think of leisure as being something like a state of mind and also the issue, not necessarily being how many numeric like numerically how many hours does someone have in a day right right like we all have 24 hours in a day like it's like something that you have like a resource that you have and everyone has 24 equal hours it's a little bit harder and more complicated to acknowledge that anyone's experience of time reflects so many things about their life right like where you are in relationships various systems of power how much your time is valued personally or at work um how far away you live from work is there good public transportation do you have children like all of these you know really important factors I think in both those cases you see something where it's like we you want it to be something with categories or numbers or something like that that you can grasp onto but it's just it just isn't you know and that's part of why you can't I can't make recommendations on that plane because like I think that it's like fundamentally misguided (laughs) I love the language metaphor. I mean, it's it's throughout the book, but I really love this idea that talking about any kind of system of time is is talking about shared experience and a shared world. And I think it's really easy to forget. I mean, it's not as simple as just getting off of social media, right? Like for <laughs> when you're in the book business, <laughs> a very lucky <laughs> few can be off of social media. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the example I'm going to use. Yeah. You know, and certainly for some people, it is a way to stay connected for, you know, if you're away from family or it it has its purpose. But if it's the only thing that's driving your interaction with the world, then you become part of the algorithm is essentially what happens. But we have so many different ways to talk about time that aren't just pieces of a clock or days of the week or, you know, work life, home life. Everything's sort of kind of mushed together at this point. When you're thinking about time for you, just Jenny on a, you know, any given moment, I mean, what does that represent for you? I mean, does it, 
do you connect with the idea of sort of being free of obligation or is it just life or is it community? I mean, does it have sort of a, a back pattern for you? I think that the way that I think about time now is closer to something that I describe in the in the middle of the book. There's a Buckeye, California Buckeye tree that I walk past very often. And it has a very particular schedule around this time of year. It's all the leaves are opening up soon. There's going to be these amazing smelling flowers because I'm going to be doing book stuff there. Like I have been invited to travel and there was like, there's been at least one trip where I'm like, I can't miss the Buckeye flower smell. It's right. only once a year. Like right. <laughs> I gotta stay here for that. It's my favorite smell. So, you know, it flowers and then it goes dormant um, in the summer mm -hmm. and stays that way. And so I remember actually before I knew much about them, I used to think they were dead trees because I would see them among a lot of other trees that still have leaves. Anyway, so they're dormant. Then they just have these little buds and the buds kind of stay there for a very long time until this time again next year. And one of the things that I mentioned in, in the description of that, you know, so-called clock is that mm -hmm. the way time proceeds through that tree or that grove of trees is very uneven uh, by mm -hmm. linear standards, right? One tree could be flowering and the tree next to it is maybe just starting to flower. And then even within one tree, oh, right. when the trees, the leaves start turning yellow, it's uneven even on one leaf, but it is happening. Like it is proceeding forward. Um, mm -hmm. And you do know that, you know, next year it's going to come back. When you look at that yellow <laughs> moving across the leaf, you just, what you really see is like, things pushing on other things, right? Things setting other things off, um, a kind of like cascade and an uneven cascade. Sometimes nothing appears to be happening, but, but it kind of is in another way, right? It's just not visible. I guess like time feels less like a series of empty boxes <laughs> to me and more like this kind of like, like things pushing on other things, like people, what people do affecting what I do and like how our time is related in that way. So it sounds like it makes you feel more connected to your actual everyday life than maybe you were before. Yeah, it do, it does. And I think it also is like, I feel more like every day is different from the last one, because I think the opposite of this view of time, the sort of like really deterministic sense of like many calendar you know, pages filled with with the boxes of time. Something about this that standardization kind of creeps into your sense of time. Like, like it can make you lose touch with the fact that like every second is different from the last one, and every second is like reacting on the on the things that happened in the second before. I think there are times when like we're all kind of reminded, like when the seasons change. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of a reminder that of oh right, like this is happening. But as I mentioned, like in the book, I think like depending on what you were doing during the pandemic, there was there was that that set, the kind of creeping sense of all time being the same. Yeah, I think that was you know? true. For, yeah, for yeah. a lot of people. I did not, however, take up baking bread. I had I some other either. stuff on my plate. And I, <laughs> pardon the bad pun, but I, you know, watching people sort of figure out how to structure time and and also figuring it out for myself and whatnot while you're also working and you know it, it just yeah everything got really squishy my sense of time got really squirrely for a while and now it's you know I like going to the office but also I you know I have cute boots I like to wear them um and I don't wear shoes in the house I just don't wear yeah. shoes in the house so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know I may as well go to the office but I mean for instance I walk to work and so I have this lovely like 20 minute Every single day, unless the weather is like, if the weather's really crazy, I'd take the subway. And I've done this walk for forever and I love it. And it just makes me really happy. And like going home, same thing. And it's like, I pretty much walk the same path, but, you know, I walk through some buildings and I walk through some parks and it's just, you know, the city smells different all the time. Sometimes it mm -hmm. smells great. And sometimes you're like, oh, I'm in the city. But yeah. It makes me love where I am and I get to do it every day. And it's never this, like, I don't see the same people. Yeah. No matter, even if I'm walking, even when I'm walking, like basically at the same time every day, I don't see the same people. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. Or even if you do, there's like this guy, I notice he always walks. I always see him when I go mm -hmm. for a walk. I yeah. must just always go for a walk at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I, and um, I've seen him for years because I live on a really steep hill and uh -huh. he walks down the hill 
and he always wears flip flops, so it's like really loud, like the flip flops, <laughs> because it's like Sorry. you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, no, I know. <laughs> and the other day, I the, like I said, years mm-hmm. of always wearing flip flops, and I saw him last week, and he was wearing sneakers. Wow, so what happened? <laughs> you know? Wow. Um, but anyway. <laughs> There's just like, yeah, there's, I mean, that's also like, you know, part of the book is like, I do mention that if you want to sort of see, if you want to grab a hold of time, this like dynamic sense of time is like, just pick one thing and pay attention to it over time. Like for me, that's the Buckeye tree or this flip flop guy. Like, you know, but if you pick sort of a constant, I didn't, I didn't actually end up using this in the book, but I learned about this concept um, Mm -hmm. of the quadrat, which is like, in like uh, environmental okay. science, like you, uh, you mark. I don't know what the what the area is, but you mark off with string like a square on the ground of okay. a study area. Okay, and that's that just becomes your study area. So you're only sort of observing oh. things happening in that square. Okay, so you like know? the bugs that walk in or the bugs that walk out, or like yeah. as something sprouts up through a crack in the side. Yeah. I love yeah. that city. Yeah, <laughs> My yeah, metaphors yeah. are all yeah. based. <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I think like that for me has been like another sort of helpful image. It's just the kind of like, right, like the the, the mental framing device um, where then you start to notice like, oh, that thing is alive and is like right. changing or it's like being reacted upon by the world. Like it's eroding, like, like things are happening. It kind of requires you to make that kind of put that stake in it first. Do you have a favorite liminal space? Like, I love being on planes because, you know, you're you're in movement and like, you know, it's also like suspended in time. I, I might be the last person who in the world who likes flying. You know, I started flying when I was a tiny person. So like, I am very used to being on planes. Like I can fall asleep like this and the whole yeah. thing. But I love that space because, you know, you're going from one place to another, but you don't really have to do anything. I used to take public transportation to Stanford from Oakland, okay. which anyone who's in the Bay Area knows that that sounds ridiculous. I also tried driving mm-hmm. and that was faster, but I, not only did I not want to drive, if I'm driving the car, <laughs> then like in any particular moment, like I could be like trying to go faster, like it's on me, you know? And there's a reason why uh, in the book, I, I, you know, I set the chapters in different locations and the chapter on like personal time management and trying to be more efficient is set in a traffic jam on 880. It's because <laughs> it's like that image of like, this is a zero sum game. If you go ahead, I am not going to get there as quickly. We are not in this together, you know, Um, versus like when you're sitting, when I would sit on the Caltrain, it's like, yeah, I'm not driving this train. We're all here on this train together. We all have an interest in it getting there on time. And in the meantime, like I can just, you know, like look at the hills or, you know, try to like pick out different things I haven't noticed before. Like I'm not on the hook to try to make things go faster. Well, not on the hook to make things go faster, but also you can actually look at what's around you. Like, obviously, when you're driving, you're driving. You can't yeah, you just be to, like, yeah. hey, what's in that window? Or wait, did I, what color was that? What, like, you just can't. Um, or yeah. you shouldn't. <laughs> you really shouldn't. If you do yeah. that while you drive, please stop. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I mean, in terms of like being present and being delighted and being surprised and the sense of serendipity, right? Like, For some people, social media has sort of become that serendipity, that sense of discovery. And I mean, I know I'm part of the algorithm. I've, I've, you know, I've carefully curated my experience online, depending on the platform and whatnot. Do I block with abandon on certain platforms? Oh, yes, I do. And I am fine (laughs) with that. You know, my life is too short. I don't need to see you and your terrible ideas. Like, go away. (laughs) But then there's other stuff where I'm like, okay, show me all of your cute what are I. But it's still essentially it's a machine connecting with what it thinks about me. And it's not all that serendipitous. There's a little bit of novelty to it, but it's still ones and zeros and ones and zeros and ones and zeros when you get to the back end. So, I mean, how do you make sure that you're cultivating that sense of delight and surprise and serendipity and and fun? I want to say it's like a it's an attitude. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, with the caveat that that is informed by other structural things, right? Like the same way that if you're driving the car, you can't look around, right? Like if they, if something is taking up a lot of space in your life or you're in a certain situation, like it's, it's a lot harder to do this. I think just like acknowledging that you could be surprised 
mm-hmm. at all. Like versus like I like going into a situation like you you know what everything is. In How to Do Nothing, I talked about uh, Martin Buber, the philosopher, like the, the concept of I thou yep. versus I it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of that also in Saving Time. There's a view of the world that in which everything is a product or like something that could be consumed or mm-hmm. it's irrelevant. Right. Um, and it's one or the other. Like the idea of like a person who who is really networky and they when they talk to you, you can tell that they're already trying to figure out what you can do for them. Like yes. that, but applied to the whole world. <laughs> yes. You know, like you you're like looking at the whole world and you're like, what can you do for me? Like that is like not a mindset that is willing to be surprised versus the like I thou kind of like, okay, other people's realities are as, you know, deep and complicated as mine we're all co- cohabiting in this like space. Um, I don't know what that person's memories mm-hmm. or um, experiences are or ideas or mm-hmm. what ideas could come out of our conversation. Like, I don't know what those are. I'm, and I should be excited by that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's so much about our culture that encourages being in the first mindset. And, and so I think it, it can be hard to maintain that or sort of keep reminding yourself, but it, but it's just like, there is no greater reward to right. me. Just before this, actually, I was going on like a very quick walk around uh, the block. And there are these birds that I talk about in uh, yeah, yeah. sometimes cedar wax wings uh-huh. that were my like gateway bird that I saw in 2013 and didn't find out what they were until like six years later or something. They're loosely migratory. They move around. They're they're only in my neighborhood during this part of the year. And they're usually in these big flocks and they, they make this sound that's like almost like it sounds like it's like on the edge upper edge of your auditory range and I usually see them like you know pretty far like they're up in a tree and they're all together yep and I was walking down the sidewalk and I just I think I was like thinking about something else I don't know and I saw and there were these cedar wax wings in a small tree so like closer to the ground like right in front of me and I was like shocked and then mm-hmm. I just couldn't move like I was just I was like there until they left that felt so unrelated to like anything that I was thinking about before that, mm-hmm. you know? And I find that those kinds of encounters, like, you know, they like kind of throw you back on yourself in a way, mm-hmm. but they're also to me reminders of that, this kind of understanding of time. Like there are these birds that are following the berries that are fruiting in this pattern, you know? And it's like, that has all been going on this whole time. And I was in my little you know, whatever. You had a great line too about learning to listen to rocks talk. And I'm still not sure <laughs> if I fully understand what you were saying, but I I like the idea. Like, I just, I like the, because when you're out in the woods, like it's not silent. It's, you know, you're standing on a hill, like you hear the wind, you like, there's so much happening and it's just not, if you're just paying attention for a second, like you can actually catch some cool stuff. Like I grew up on the ocean and like, you know, you can't really predict what the ocean's going to do and you shouldn't always yeah. think that you, you know what the ocean's going to gonna do. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, I know the Northern no- California beach, yeah. <laughs> right? There's yeah. nothing quite like the ocean to keep you really humble. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> really um, humble and really in perspective. But, like, it's so mutable and so changeable and, like, it's never the same from minute to minute. And it's like, you know, I just want to be able to say to people, go, go stand you know, on the edge of a body of water anywhere. And again, I fully understand that there are people who can't do that. So yeah. this idea of leisure as a state of mind or being able to find serendipity wherever you can, I think is really delightful and really, it makes yeah. me hopeful for people because we're living in a really weird moment. Yeah. It's stressful and hard and everything's kind of you know, not quite what a lot of people expected, no matter what they believe or where they are. And it's like, well, why not be hopeful? And you write really hopeful books. And I'm not sure everyone necessarily sees that, but I'm just kind of like, oh, yeah, there's poss- there's so much possibility, I think is what I'm trying to say. I think I'm also um, trying to, like, make use of how innate like I think curiosity is yeah. for people because curiosity is kind of like a way towards hope right mm-hmm. it's in it's in that direction um and speaking of like you know accessibility I did mm-hmm. I did think that during the pandemic uh one of the statistics that I came across that I really loved was the uptick in visits to bird webcams 
So like, you oh. know, if you can't go somewhere, yeah. um, there is still, the, I, I find that really interesting because the webcam, because it's live. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, that to me is very different than even watching a past recording of a webcam. Mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned, looking at the webcam uh, for the a pair of Osprey in Richmond, which is not mm -hmm. far from here, having it sort of on my <laughs> laptop with other things going on and looking at the sky on the webcam and it's dark gray, right? And then I look out and my went, oh, right. It's the, this, that's the sky, right? It's the same yep. sky. Um, but that I was also looking at one of the uh, uh, eagle in Iowa and then obviously there's a time difference there right so the fact that during that time which was so difficult for so many people and in which time felt very mm. kind of stultifying that people did that 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 was a reaction that mm -hmm. you know a lot of people got into birding but also a lot more people were looking at these webcams that had always been there and being interested in yeah. the activities of these birds also I mean you know it's uh the beginning of the pandemic sort of lined up with spring migration but also nesting so like you know what like waiting for the eggs to hatch mm -hmm. like it's very easy to get invested in that you know when did you start working on saving time because i know how to do nothing came out of remarks you delivered at a conference it became that yeah. became the first section of that book and obviously we were all at home after how to do nothing came out in hardcover in 19 but i do remember feeling like how to do nothing was everywhere and you were still talking to, there was a lot happening for the book. And even though you weren't traveling, I mean, that takes a lot of energy to, you know, yeah. bounce around and do all that stuff. So when did you conceive of saving time and, and when did you sort of start putting it all together? Because there's a ton of research that went into this book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of those things um, that it's almost similar to something that I talk about in the conclusion of saving time, which is like, when does some, when can something properly be said to have happened or have started like those debris flows in LA, like they happen after there's a summer fire. So when did it really start? You know, is it when the rocks are coming down the hill in the winter or did it start? With, you know, so like it's, I feel similarly about my process. Like when yeah. did it really start? There's actually this funny detail that in how did you nothing? I mentioned being in that cabin with no reception. One of the things I was doing in that cabin was I was trying to write a very early outline for a proposal for how to do nothing. <laughs> and I and I recently came across my notes from that time mm -hmm. and I had it divided into how to do nothing in space and how to do nothing in time. And mm -hmm. I obviously ended up kind of going more in, in the space direction because of yeah. my emphasis on bioregionalism, you know, being more aware of the place that you're in. But there's also an implicit argument already in, in How Did You Nothing that not all time should be money. So it's kind of like in there, right? But because of that other column, like sometimes I think of this as like the long lost twin of How Did You Nothing. Sometimes also I don't know that something's research until later. Yeah. So I think I was just paying attention to stuff that was related to that. Yeah. Um, and I think that increased when I was getting you know feedback about How Did You Nothing having to do with time, like mm -hmm. people sort of encountering those ideas and having this objection about time, you know, uh, like who has time. And so that was just kind of ongoing, like yeah. the whole time. And the proposal was actually, most of it was written before the pandemic started. So it it's strange, right? Because then it's like, it ended up, you know, some of the things that I think I was thinking about a little bit more abstractly when I wrote the proposal became much more concrete or much more immediate during the pandemic. Yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that. I mean, I'm laughing only because when you said long lost twin, I was like, Oh, I described the book as siblings in my notes. Oh yeah. Cause they well, feel like, they feel like siblings. <laughs> yeah. Like they just, they feel like they feed each other in different ways. And you know, yeah. Okay. So a book is a way of capturing time on the page. Like, yeah, I mean, it does belong more. The novel is, you know, sort of specifically designed to do that. But I love the idea that they sort of, I feel like I can see how saving time sort of grew out of how to do nothing. But it feels like you've been thinking about this stuff for a really long time. I'm also, when you were the artist in residence at the San Francisco dump, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the project, but it's such a great idea. Oh, the Bureau of Suspended Objects. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Can we just go back to that for two? Because I yeah. love this idea and it just, it feels like I can look back at that and sort of see how all of your work connects. 
And I'm just wondering if there's anything coming after this that is maybe not a book and maybe we'll see something more like the Bureau of Suspended Objects again. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I am just as curious as you are about that okay. because <laughs> I am doing a residency right now where it's technically three months long, but it's three months over three years. So oh. you do like, you could do like one month, one year, one month the following year. Like it okay. adds up to three months over okay. three years. Okay. So I did three weeks of it already. It's local. It's like near the Santa Cruz Mountains. I am very grateful to them for letting it be extremely open-ended right now because, you know, you kind of have to give something space before you know what it is. But I know what I am interested in, which is kind of pursuing some of the questions around geology, geological history that are in Saving Time. But like local local expressions of that. I live very close to the San Andreas Fault. Yep. Um, and I, I am old enough that I remember the 1989 earthquake. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember like feeling it. <laughs> I had yeah. cousins on the Bay Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> like oh literally on the Bay Bridge. When it's it's terrifying. So, yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. Um, they're fine. You, I just want to be clear. Yeah. They're fine. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. were on the bridge. Yeah. Just, I've been sort of looking into more like what sort of what made those mountains that I grew up looking at every single day. Like they're just kind yeah. of in the background. You can see them. I don't know where that will go and I don't know what even format that will take. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Miranda July once and Mm -hmm. so I was looking through her, um, she has kind of like, not a monograph, a book of all her projects. Yep. And I was looking through that and somewhere in there, maybe she mentioned it. She said that she would have an idea for a project and then she would mark like somewhere on the page, like what it would be. Like, is it a book? Is it a performance? Because she does all those things, right? Like, I think I also kind of think a little bit like that where it's like, I don't, I think I have the idea first and then I just kind of do whatever yeah. I need to do for it to make the most sense. That's the only way that I, I have an MFA. Like I was trained as a visual artist. So um, I really, it didn't make sense for me to write a book, but I also felt that for me to get my ideas across in that particular instance, it needed to be a book. Okay. As a reader, yeah, you needed to write the book. I'm just saying you needed to write the book. Yeah. (laughs) I had quite a good time with both of them. Can we talk about literary influences for a second? Because I I knew this would happen and I knew we'd end up bumping against time. But you, I mean, you talk about Rebecca Solnit. You actually shout out a buddy of mine, Garnet Cadigan. Oh, love that essay. Yeah. Walking While Black is one of my favorite essays. Like, I just, I was so delighted when I saw him shout it out. Yeah, yeah. But um, who else do you read? Who else has sort of shaped you as a writer? I mean, I think, you know, Robin Wall Kimmerer is someone that I really admire um, for a lot of reasons. But I mean, it, just in terms of like writerly influence, like her form of storytelling, it's so it's so easy to read. And it's so, and it's such a well-constructed story that it that you don't sort of realize until later, like how profound it was. But so it doesn't feel difficult. It doesn't almost feel as difficult as it should for like what it's doing. So it's like doing, you know, conceptual heavy lifting, but so lyrical at the same time. And so like, that's something that I really, I really admire. I think actually a lot of my influences are, are not writers. Okay. Um, Let's talk about them too. You know, I taught art for many years Mm -hmm. and there, there are some people that I would always come back to like, uh Yoko Ono for example yeah um Grapefruit her her collection of um I don't really know what to call they're not I guess they're instructions um Uh, yeah let's I mean yeah yeah, let's use that because I'm kind of like yeah yeah for anyone who hasn't seen them they're like each page has I think you could also maybe describe them as poems Mm -hmm. but they're they read like sets of instructions they tell the reader to do something and the the actual like art piece is you doing it Yes. So the art piece is not the text on the page. Right. But I think there's one that's like, take a bag of peas with you and leave a pea wherever you go. <laughs> just like, I love that so much. Um, but there's some other ones that are just like, they're actually, they're just so beautiful. Like you should actually do them, right? Like you should actually sit and imagine things like in the order that she's telling you to. And I think one reason that has been so, you know, that and other projects by you know fluxus artists in mm-hmm. the fluxus movement around that yep. time have been so influential for me is that those pieces they they sort of don't call attention to themselves they feel much more about they feel generous to me like yeah uh, almost like I don't want to use the word disposable like in regards to those or my work but but it does sometimes come up to me as like this is the thing to help you achieve something some kind of way of seeing the world and it's about that it's not really about this thing that helped you get there. You know what I mean? 
it's like I want someone to get to the end of my book and then and then they go outside the world looks different feels different and that's what it's actually about not the book if that makes sense it totally does I as you were talking I was thinking yeah the world gets bigger I mean, yeah. if if we can change the way that we interpret time, right? Like this whole time is money, whatever. If you if you can change the way you interpret time and the way you break out sort of the value of time, you know, we've talked about leisure, we've talked about experience, we've talked about consumerism. But if you can change those and tweak those ideas, you get to have a bigger world. Yeah. Right. And you get yeah. to define it in a new way. And I just I think that's really groovy. I think that's what yeah. art is for. I think. Yeah. That's, right. I, you know? and it's like, as someone who has been on the receiving end of that, like I, those are some of my favorite experiences. Like mm-hmm. I write in How to Do Nothing about seeing a John Cage piece performed yeah. and then going outside into the city that I had lived in for many years at that point yeah. and sort of hearing everything for the first time. And it's like I cannot really imagine anything more than that, that something could give you so much of art and writing and poetry and music does that. But I think like those, I love those fluxes pieces because they're so, they're deceptive. They seem very minimal and sometimes they're like a little jokey, but they're actually like deeply profound. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's great. Yeah. And that also seems like a pretty good place to wrap up because what you've handed us, Jenny O'Dell, is a lot of possibility and I'm all for possibility. You know, we all just need a little more possibility right now. Jenny O'Dell, thank you so much. Saving Time is out now, and so is How to Do Nothing. And if you haven't read that one yet, go get them both. Thank you so much. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of great books to pick up when you stop in for your copy of Saving Time. I'm Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati. And I'm joined by my book buddy, Madison. Hello, Madison. Hello, I'm Madison, joining you from my Barnes & Noble in Los Angeles. So we've got a couple of great books to cover. I'm going to dive right in. I was thinking a lot about Jenny O'Dell and the way that she really helps promote leisure time in a way that doesn't feel too fluffy, if that makes sense. She's very poignant in the way that she talks about these things. And it made me think of a book that came out not too long ago called Do Nothing by Celeste Headley. Uh, This is a book that touches on the roots of this American phenomenon that we have to be as productive as possible in order to show our worth. I think Celeste helps argue that point that maybe overworking is not a sign of worth, that perhaps it is actually doing the opposite, uh, that you, when you are spreading yourself too thin, then you're actually ruining the productivity that you claim to own for yourself. So Headley looks at things like Puritanism, capitalism as driving forces uh, to, well, drive us into a frenzy. And I think the ever-increasing emphasis on efficiency and productivity, it bleeds into our personal lives. Uh, And I think the boundaries between your work life and your actual living home life gets blurred pretty easily. And again, just makes us ultimately less productive than we thought we were going to be. Headley asserts the importance of leisure, of course, human connection without the use of social media, just like a face-to-face conversation, perhaps, or maybe even a phone call, and downtime. And she just urges us to trust our human instincts and give some time to ourselves that not only have we earned it, but it will make us more productive in the long run. So that is Do Nothing by Celeste Headley. Madison, what do you have for us? So when I was thinking of books to recommend, I was really stuck on the concept of time. I think when we talk about time, it's so interesting, which is why I chose Still Pictures by Janet Malcolm, because she pairs pictures within this memoir. And what is a picture other than a moment captured in time? So what I love about this memoir is that she takes moments in her life, like just a quick snapshot of a picture. It can be leisurely. It can be an important photo. We all have photos in our life. But she creates it into a story. So you take this picture and you watch her go deeper. Through her photography, you see her, how she came from Europe and is now in New York. And there's still that constant tug. You see her life as a young woman, growing first loves, all of these moments that she has captured in time and then has created into this eloquent memoir that just shows that even when you have those like tiny moments, they are filled with 
so much memory and so much sadness, love, angst, hatred, what have you. Pictures can capture anything, which is why I love when authors pair a different medium with their writing, because words also conduct a moment in time, but so do these still pictures. So when I was thinking of a book to recommend, I was really stuck on that concept of time and how pictures really capture that, which is why I chose Still Pictures by Janet Malcolm. Fantastic. That's a great memoir. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, Patty Smith's new book, where she just is doing snapshots and little pieces of her life that I think make up just this beautiful tapestry. So nice choice, as usual. Well, that is all we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. And I'm Madison. You can follow my store at BN Events Grove. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Happy reading. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.